Speaking of music, I got my buddy Matthew Wilder on the show today. I think you're gonna wanna check this one out. If you are an aspiring producer, songwriter, artist, musician of any type, I think what Matthew's talking about is super important. Matthew is the songwriter and artist behind Break My Stride, the 1983 monster hit. He is the producer behind No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom. He's the songwriter of the songs from the Disney movie Mulan. Matthew's story has so many twists and turns, places he never thought he would go, things that have turned out that were not per design. This is a great talk. Hope you'll check it out. If you're digging what we're doing here on the channel, and by we, I mean me, I hope you will like and subscribe. That would be greatly appreciated. Just press that little like and give me a thumbs up if you're digging it. We've been we've been talking a lot lately. We're working on all kinds of stuff, and the struggles of the of the process is always uh, amazing to me. When I'm talking to someone who, uh, from the outside look, looking in, looks like, and that that cat has arrived, and then the struggles are the same. Maybe before we even get into that, let's start back at the beginning. Talk about where you came from, what you've been what you've been working on over these years. From the East Coast, as you are, New Yorker. A New Yorker, a New Yorker. My, my mother was an opera singer, a Juilliard graduate. My father was a press agent on Broadway, so there was a lot of that in the DNA. And my brother brought home a guitar one day and showed me my first three chords, and that was, that was it for me. And I started studying uh, classical piano when I was four. Okay. So there was a, a good foundation there, and when like everybody else, when the Beatles and the Stones arrived, that's when everything went right out the window. Yeah. And, but you were right in that, you were in that sweet spot for it, right? right? Grew up on Long Island till I was 14, then moved into Greenwich Village in the late 60s, and that's when it, my head exploded. <laughs> As you're in high school and all this stuff is going on, you're starting to play guitar. Mm -hmm. You've already been playing piano. Right. Is music, how is music starting to become part of your life? It's just a natural uh, evolution for me. It was, it was always in my life, and I, you're not sure of yourself when you're 14 years old, um, so you're just following the tips of your toes and moving toward the things that turn you on and, and that you relate to. I was meeting other creative people at school, and there right. were so many of them. Right. And I was the I was the odd duck. I was the the square peg in a round hole because when I moved into New York, my hair was was short. I was wearing very conservative clothing, and everybody at this high school had hair down to here, and they were already smoking dope. And I was on a fast learning. Yeah, you curve. had to catch up. I needed to catch up. So uh, some of the people that I was hanging with, we got together and were listening and to and playing music together and uh and would you do shows you're playing out in the park yeah playing uh playing for change uh, yeah out busking but that's where um i got i caught my first break when i was 18 or 19 years right. old so how did that happen uh very simple we were playing in washington square and it was a hot summer day and we had a huge crowd i seem to remember that my father had tipped off a couple of professionals and they came down to see us and their minds were blown because we were we had a, a guitar case full of money and all these people around us and before you know it um, we're being offered a record deal in California and they flew us out to LA and I recorded my first album when I was 19 years old I left Pratt and we toured forever and it wasn't until we played Knoxville, Tennessee, I remember it very well because we had we ended a gig all the way in, uh, in I think we were in Raleigh, North, North Carolina, and we drove all night long for, to play a, a morning, an early afternoon gig in Knoxville, 
Tennessee's a really long state, and Knoxville right. was clear across the state. So we got there, and we were exhausted, and only 10 people showed up to the gig. And later that evening, I told Peter, uh, I was done. I don't want to do this anymore. So I wanted to find out who I was and, uh, and reinvent myself. So your duo breaks up, mm -hmm. and you decide you're going to go off on your own and you know maybe reinvent yourself or figure out what's next. For four years, and then at the end of four years, I got restless and started making trips back out to Los Angeles. Uh -huh. The guy that was my road manager back when I was 19 had moved out here, so I followed him out here. And by then I was turning into my late 20s, mm -hmm. you know, mid 26, 27 years old. Came out to LA. You're starting to get a little old to have a hit, a but it's... The, long in the tooth. And, <laughs> and, and what was your music like at this point? My music was probably still centered around singer-songwriter and Jackson Brown, Billy Joel and... So you're, so you're writing songs. Mm -hmm. you've, you've come out to LA to kind of kick the tires a little bit. There was a period where I was broke, and um, I called home. I said, send money. No, you, sorry, kiddo. You're on your own. So there was a, a restaurant, a two-restaurant chain. If that's a chain, there were two restaurants. It's a short chain. A short chain, a very <laughs> small chain, two links uh, in, in L.A. called the Great American Food and Beverage Company. And the trick to this uh, establishment was that you had to be a musician. You had to audition to work at this restaurant. And uh, I really, 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 really didn't want to work there. But I really, really, really needed the money. Anyway, so I'm, I'm standing in the kitchen. It's my first day. And I'm dressed in this ridiculous outfit. And a bunch of us are lined up. And... The coked up manager was marching up and down in front of us like a drill sergeant. And as we're standing there listening to this madman, the kitchen door swings open, and who should walk in but none other than Peter Tork from the Monkees. And I watch Peter Tork walk by me, take a time card, and punch in the time clock, and get in line right next to me. And my mouth dropped open. And it became evident at that point that he was working as a waiter at the restaurant. I mean, this was Peter Tork from the fucking Monkees. This man, you know, was as big, if yeah. not bigger, than the Beatles in the U.S. at one point. And I watched my whole life pass before my eyes. So let's, let's start to edge toward uh, Stride. Yeah. I had signed a production deal. I had a, a contract that was not a very good contract where I had to write songs uh, on consignment and I had to fill a quota. So during that period of time, I had written Break My Stride toward the end of my relationship. And uh, I never really told this story before, but um, things had gotten so bad in the relationship and, and they were withholding money, funds from me because I was behind in my quota. So in order to fill my quota, I started writing Beatles songs backwards and just, you know, throwing them tune after tune. Every once in a while, I was inspired and I'd write something that I liked. And I remember I wrote Stride in, in a, a fit one afternoon. It came pouring out of me in about a 30-minute shot. I just had a sixth sense about this particular song. So we're, we're in the graveyard shift at, at, at uh, Pasha Studios, and uh, Chuba Petotes is our recording engineer, and we record Stride. My recollection is we recorded it in one night, and we called up friends of ours who were having a party down the street and told them to come over and sing on the back end of the, of the record. And we make the record, and I had no prospects. Six months later, I was signed to a new record label by a man by the name of Joe Isgro, and Stride is a worldwide, worldwide hit. hit. Number five, was it, on that? Five, worldwide. Five. And for more of what you want to hear, let's get back to Matthew Wilder. Never let another girl like you up to say, oh, nothing's gonna 
And so now this is life changing. Yeah. This is this is a big big turning point. This you is know, because you've been you've been making music and skating by on it your whole life at this point. And right. You know, you're not you're not a kid. You didn't have no, a hit, I was hit when you were. Years yeah. Old. I'm so, 30 years old. And so what happens? We were sitting in a pizza joint in, in Beverly Hills the first time I heard it come on the radio. And I was like, wait a minute. Nobody say anything. That's when we knew that there was a sea change. I'll have another <laughs> slice. <laughs> <laughs> Garçon, pizza on the house. So that's when, you know, that's when my life really changed. But during that time, you're still in the midst of making the album that it's on. Yes. <laughs> we blazed through making that record. And I remember at one point showing up at the studio thinking, you know, we had some overdubs that we were going to do. And, and Peter and Cheese, Rick, Rick's nickname was Cheese, turned to me and said, we're out of money. The record's done. I said, what do you mean the record's done? The record's not done. We still, you know, this isn't finished. It's finished. You know, f everybody was flying by the seat of their pants, and we were playing catch-up. All right. And the record is now a worldwide hit, and I go to the label and I say, here's my idea for a video. I wanted to do something like The Point or Yellow Submarine. And they just laughed at me, and they said, <laughs> animation? You're not even getting a video. And it was the beginning of MTV. And I said, how? How can you do this to me? What do you mean I'm not getting a video? They said, the song's already a hit. What do we need a video for? I said, because I have a career and I'd like to be in the same arena as my contemporaries and be able to have something on this other format. And these guys, they figured we already won. Right. So I didn't get a video. There is no video except for the footage of me appearing on Dick Clark and Solid Gold and all those, you know, embarrassing moments. And then they sent me off to Europe for live appearances and personal appearances on all these TV shows, Top of the Pops and German Top of the Pops. But you didn't tour that Comedy album like you did, like you did, uh, no, the, the Matthew and mm -hmm. Peter stuff. No, you just wouldn't did one off personal appearances, it a show. It was just a bunch of TV and 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 alike, and uh, it just was again a, a co another theme that comes into my career where I'm I'm fighting for legitimacy, and it's just it's just not in the cards. I'm not destined to be following a path where my heroes and my contemporaries were headed. I was feeling that I didn't have the full toolkit that mm -hmm. everybody else had. Well, it's funny how so many of us feel that way, but I think it, you know, in retrospect, you, man, you, you've, you have a wild path, mm -hmm. you know, and you've done all kinds of things, and, and so many of these things wouldn't have happened were it not for you know, previous circumstances. Right. Um, and to me, that's what's so interesting. It's why I wanted to talk to you, and that's what's so interesting when I talk to everybody, because to me, that's really what the crux of it really is for making a life in music, you know? Um, certainly, the, the, the kind of people you have in mind, you know, they're, they're really the outliers. My heroes, uh, they, there was, there's, at least from the outside looking in, there appeared to be some logic to what they were doing. You start at the bottom, you make a, a, a great little demo, which becomes a, a record, and then from the record you you know, you make the album, and from the album you start touring, and then and you have a career. That's not that was not in the cards for me. Let's follow it along to some of these other uh, interesting points along the way. Following Stride, uh, I made a second album, and there's a there was a definitive turning point. I get a call from my manager who says. Joe Isgro wants us to come up to his restaurant and, and meet with him. And I thought this was going to be a victory dinner because Stride was now a bona fide hit. And my manager says, yeah, 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 uh, it's a whatever. But if the subject of publishing comes up, there's none available just so that we have our story straight. And I thought, oh, okay. So we drive up to the restaurant on Sunset Boulevard, and Joe owns this restaurant. 
and he's sitting in his booth and it's very dark and if you can picture something out of The Godfather, you're in the neighborhood of, of the environment that we're walking into. And we walk up to his, his booth and uh, he's by himself and we sit down and, and Al, my manager, says to him, hey Joe, you know, what's with the guys sitting over in the corner? And he says, oh, those are the feds. They've been following me all day long. <laughs> and shoot a glance at my manager. And we didn't get to drinks before Joe says to me, hey, listen, you know, uh, you're lucky if you have, you know, a couple of good songs on your record. Let's say on your next album that you're going to make for me, you put a couple or a few of my tunes on your record. Now... I had just come from the School of Hard Knocks with Clive Davis and again one of those out-of-body experiences where my mouth is saying something before my brain is engaged and I hear myself say let's get one thing straight right here and right now nobody tells me what to cut I'm a songwriter and before I could get the full sentence out of my mouth, Joe is reaching across the table for my throat. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. And Al is between the two of us, and he's holding us apart. And he's screaming at me, I gave you a fucking hit record. And I said, I gave you a fucking hit record. I'm from New York, you know. I, I know this drill all too well. And I just was not in the mood to be pushed around and I was telling him basically my wife and newborn baby are sitting in a hovel in West Hollywood we're living in a, a shack and I haven't seen any money from the fruits of my labor and you're already hitting me up for more and we leave the restaurant and we get in the car and driving back to my little apartment in West Hollywood Al says to me, you were brilliant in there tonight. Joe really respected you. And I said, you mark my words. My career ended there in, in there tonight. And that's what happened. And he was out to teach me a lesson. The second album uh, that I made barely got any play or, or push. And uh, that was the end of my solo career at that point. And uh, that was a, a big life lesson. So getting to your point, um, I then had to revert to back to what I know. And it was a very daunting period in my life because um, although I had made some money and we, would, we could skate for a while, I really didn't know who I was and what kind of a career was in store for me. So I had a relationship with um, a publisher by the name of Ronnie Vance who came along and kind of picked me up and dust me off and signed me to Geffen Publishing of Geffen Records. And then I went to work there as a staff songwriter, which was um, n not to downplay that uh, position in the, in the industry, but it, it felt like, it felt at the time that it was a fall from grace for me. It, it was coming down off of, a, off of a huge hit, a mountaintop, and it was putting my ego in check. So I, for the next couple or a few years, I started writing and working on my pr production chops because as you're making demos and trying to get songs placed, um, the better the demo, the more valuable you became to the artist sure. that was latching on to and that's back when songs were really, the, the, the publishing business was still uh, running in, in a capacity where you could actually play songs. And so were you, were you placing songs? Were you yeah. Getting... I placed a tune called Wild Women Do in the Pretty Woman uh, movie uh, and was co-producer for Natalie Cole, Sheena Easton, um, Patti LaBelle. There was a lot of R&B back at that time that was... Uh, you can place songs with. So as that's happening, I mean, that's a formidable career. That's a, that's well, a thing. Was, it, I wasn't living high on the hog, but I was able to, to make enough money so I could be a professional and, and keep going. 
uh, it was an odd place to be where, you know, you were known for this, I was officially stamped as a one hit wonder because I, I cut my teeth on being a, an artist. That's what I wanted to do. So uh, I needed to have some sort of an, a, another outlet for my creativity and, and writing songs for other artists was not what I wanted to do. I thought maybe sometime I could get back up on the on the horse and be a recording artist again at some at some stage along my career, but I wasn't getting any younger. The timeline as I condense it, opportunities were starting to open up more and more for me. And I remember uh, I had landed a position for writing songs for a movie, a Kevin Bacon movie called The, the Air Up There. So while I was in doing this, the guy that was a and that soundtrack was a man by the name of Tony Ferguson. And Tony was sitting in the back of the studio one day and he was watching me work and during a break, he takes me aside and he says, listen, I signed this band to Interscope and they're about to make their second record. They've been through several producers and uh, we can't seem to get it right. Um, have you ever produced a band before? And I said, no. He said, are you interested? And I said, yeah. I mean, I was saying yes to everything. Uh, I was hungry and yeah. I wanted... I wanted every opportunity to get away from this, this hamster wheel that I was on. So I was grabbing onto anything and everything that was coming along. And uh, he said, well, it's a band out of... It's just, i got to interject and just say it's interesting how you frame that because it sounds to me like you were cooking at this point. Yes and no. I mean, I was, I was a, utility, a utilities guy. I had a toolkit yeah, cool, where set, yeah. people were throwing things at me uh, and I was... I was versatile enough where I was able to pretty much rise to the occasion. If they wanted me to do this, I'd do this. And if you want me to go here, I'd go here. So I was really just right. doing whatever was in my path. Right. And this was thrown in my path. And he said, do you, want, do you want to meet this band? I said, yeah, okay. So I drive down to Anaheim and I meet this ska band by the name of No Doubt. A bunch of angry uh, punk rockers that were a unit, that were local heroes, that had maybe a following of three or four thousand people in Orange County. That took me a year and a half to make a record that ultimately became Tragic Kingdom. So I'm working on, on Tragic Kingdom and while we're working on that record, when I say we, it's myself, the manager, the A&R guy, we're trying to pull them away from the ska and develop a sound for them that was not so singular in its direction. And we would record four sides and then break and have them go back and write more. And at the time that I met them, Gwen's brother was the main songwriter and he would write all the material and Gwen would sing it. So I started to encourage the other guys, Tony the bass player, and Tom, the guitarist, as well as Eric, the brother, to open up the, the writing style. And why don't you all write? And Gwen, while you're at it, you should be writing as well. And think more along the lines of New Wave, maybe. Blondie. We were just throwing ideas at them. And halfway through the making of that record, Eric quits the band because he doesn't like losing control of the direction. Um, they fire the manager. And I'm, when the smoke clears, I'm the last man standing, and I was like the fourth producer. They had fired Albie Galutin. I can't remember who else had been fired. So I'm hanging on for dear life to make it through this experience. And it's, um, it's a rough ride. Did you see the potential in it while you were working on it? No. I thought we were making the most odd sounding record and I didn't know if this was commercial. I didn't know what it meant. Turned out it was anybody. commercial. Well, we'll, we can, it. we'll get to that. <laughs> but honestly, I mean... Uh, well, I, the, ju I, the jury is in doubt on whether it was commercial or not. That was probably one of the biggest records of the decade. It's taking a year and a half for us to make it and I'm thinking, and we're, and nobody's getting along with one another and everybody's, you know, 
uh, I, I'm hanging by a thread. We finally make it across the finish line, and I remember sitting with, with Tony in my house, playing him the rough mixes to the album, and I put on Don't Speak. And Tony says at the end, he says, if we can get to that one, it's not the first single, but if we can get to that one, that's the one that's gonna take them worldwide. No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom was one of the biggest albums of 1997. We submit the album to Jimmy Iovine, the <coughs> label, and this is my truth. My recollection is we submitted the album and Jimmy wanted to drop the band. He didn't want to put it out. And then Rob Kahane and Paul Palmer, who were running Trauma Records, they had a small subsidiary at, at Interscope, were having success with a band called Bush, Gavin Rossdale and his crew. And they heard the roughs of what became Tragic Kingdom. And they said, give it to us. We know exactly what to do with it. We'll promote it. And Paul Palmer mixed the album with his, his partner. And within six months, it was a bona fide smash. They, were, they released Just a Girl. Uh, I don't remember the succession of the of the singles, but they were they put out five singles, one right after another, was blowing up at K Rock. Now, while all that is going on, I'm signed to Disney um, in this creative deal, and I I ink the deal. And the day that I ink the deal, I'm ushered into Tom Schumacher's office, who was the creative head of the animation department at Disney. And he sits me down, he says, congratulations. And I said, thank you. I thought he was congratulating me for signing the creative deal. He says to me, today's your lucky day. I said, why? He said, we just fired the composer on this project and you're the replacement. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah. We have this project called Mulan. And I'm thinking, what's a Mulan? And uh, you're it. And, and I find myself being ushered out of his office into my first staff meeting of about 20, 25 people. One of the things I notice about your career as you tell the story is you're always being ushered somewhere. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'll ultimately be ushered down that final aisle. It, this it's, is this is why it's, it's like crazy. I said, it's a it's a wild story to me. Like, you know, you you know, following following stride, mm -hmm. you kind of get yourself on a on a working path, and you're figuring out how to do it. You're getting your production chops up. Right. You're polishing your songwriting. You're working. You're getting stuff going on, mm -hmm. and then all at the same time, you have things blowing up. All around, all, all around you at the same time, and you know, massive. Mass. It was it was an amazing time. Uh, this confluence of all these events that I never, ever, ever in a million years could have imagined. Uh, to me, like your story, I mean, it, that's the happiest ending of how it can go, and that's the ending. But you know, right. the happiest you know outcome of a of a of a career. Yeah. But it, but I feel like in a nutshell, that is how it goes. It's not. It's not a one thing, you know what I mean? No. It's like you built a lot of things toward what wound up being a, an amazing confluence of successes all at once, but that's, that's the path, man. And each time you were, you know, you were, you were following, you know, a combination of where your creativity was taking you as well as holding on for how, to, how to just stay afloat and, and work. Just, you know, just don't lose the gig. Don't lose the yeah. gig. Just, you know, do your best, keep your nose down. Mm -hmm. And after having had the success of Stride and some of the ego tripping that went on through that period uh, and, and being kicked to the curb, that was a life lesson, really valuable life lesson. If there's anything to take, to pay forward, yeah. uh, that um, humility is king and to, you know, to just do the best that you can um, and that's all anyone can ever ask. So, you know, following the, the, the the Grammy nomination and the, the success of Tragic Kingdom and, and Mulan comes out right. and uh, that's uh, tremendously successful as well. And then you go on to work with a, a whole bunch of artists who everyone would know who they are. 
Uh, yeah, to some degree, but I think that what, what's also important to, to underscore is that uh, things came on fast and furiously, and there was, a, there was obviously a period in which uh, I was being uh, pulled from pillar to post to, to produce uh, like I'd never produced before, project after project after project, most of which were young, new artists people that were not known and, and to this day will never be known, that there's a lot of, of great, great work that for whatever reason, for various reasons, um, never made it, never made the, 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 the noise that, that some of these other uh, projects had uh, um, realized. And no project was any less uh, viable or worthy of um, notoriety than the next and I felt after a certain point that I was I had gotten to a place where I was on an assembly line where I was accepting gig after gig after gig and 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 feeding the beast so to speak because we were living you know in a greater greater capacity and maybe at some point beginning to lose sight of um, the original in, intent. I don't want to sound like an ultra an ultra purist, but um, you get to a point where you 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 find yourself back on that hamster wheel again. And uh, how do you get off? How do you get back into and back to the place of what started this whole thing in the first place? And feeling fulfilled and feeling like you're doing this from a place of creativity and not just putting money in the bank. Certainly. Well, Matthew, man, thank you, man. Thank you for sitting down with me and doing this. Yeah, I'm certainly is, glad enough. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there, man. Cool.